Hi, I'm Lindsay. And I'm Marshall. Welcome to Tumble, the show where we explore stories of science discovery. Today, the science behind the rise of the dinosaurs. The age of the dinosaurs lasted 165 million years, but how did it start? The story involves fascinating fossils, intense lava eruptions, climate craziness, and ultimately the dinosaurs' domination of Earth. We're going to find out what happened and how scientists discovered it all. We have two dino-related questions for today's episode. Hi, my name is Elizabeth and I'm nine years old. My question is, what is the oldest dinosaur? I think that scientists might try to find the answer to my question by using fossils. Hi, I'm Andy from Pennsylvania and I'm six years old. My question is, how did the dinosaurs come alive? I think they came alive from the first animals. And I think scientists can find fossil evidence. Thank you. So Elizabeth wants to know the name of the first dinosaur on the planet. And Andy wants to know how dinosaurs came to be. Seems like they're asking really similar questions. I think so, too. Both of them are about how dinosaurs evolved in the first place. And, like, how did the age of dinosaurs come about? How dinosaurs get so awesome and stay awesome for so long? Exactly. And it turns out, the story of how dinosaurs came to be is as exciting and dramatic as the story of how they went extinct. They go from being very small, non-dominant creatures in their ecosystem to being the massive predators that we think of them today. That's scientist Jessica Whiteside. She studies mass extinctions, especially the one that led to the rise of the dinosaurs 200 million years ago. I asked her how she ended up doing what she does. As my mom likes to say, I always like to play in dirt, and still today I continue to play in dirt. Um, But I think it was a fascination for how things came to be. So next time your parents tell you you're getting dirty, you've got a great excuse. This could be your career. Exactly. So Jessica begins our story by taking us back to the time of the oldest dinosaurs, the Triassic period, 230 million years ago. So this was a very different world than what we live in today. Instead of the planet being arranged in the continents as we know them, there was actually one giant supercontinent named Pangaea. It basically looked just like Pac-Man, but straddled the equator and stretched from pole to pole. Basically, if you think of today's continents as puzzle pieces, Pangaea is the finished puzzle. It was one big landmass. It must have been like a lot easier to color in maps of the world back then, which was obviously something people were concerned about. <laughs> Just like a chunk of green, like, okay, green is Pangaea, and then blue is the ocean. There's just one. We actually only had one giant ocean called the Panthalassic Ocean, and it was a very, very warm world. The Triassic was a hot time for evolution. So mammals evolve in the Triassic, but very, very small ones. Lizards were there. Crocodile-like creatures were on the planet. A whole slew of very bizarre, funky things that only existed for about 60 million years were there as well. Pterosaurs evolve at the same time. The flying reptiles that are not dinosaurs but did live alongside them. And turtles as well. (laughs) <laughs> Sounds like an awesome supercontinent animal party. <laughs> like, yo, come to Pangaea. We got a bunch of bizarre, funky things here. Also turtles. <laughs> the turtles are the hardest partiers. <laughs> you know that, right? <laughs> it just takes them a long time. <laughs> like, I'm totally dancing now. Scientists can still see the remains of this evolutionary party in what's called the rock record. Like, check out this awesome rock record. I'll put it on the turntable now. Let's keep this party evolving. (laughs) A geologist's rock record is a little bit different from that. It's how they tell the ages of the layers of sedimentary rock going back hundreds of millions of years. It helps paleontologists match up fossils around the world. 
And the first two dinosaurs come from the same levels in the rock record. And those are from Argentina. And their names are Eoraptor and Herarosaurus. Eoraptor and Herarosaurus were both springy-looking dinosaurs that walked upright on two legs with shorter, little arms. Eoraptor would have only come up to an adult's knees and Herarosaurus to our hips. So those are the first two dinosaurs then? The first that we know of. Probably were earlier dinosaurs, but we don't actually have them preserved. Meaning we haven't found any fossils of older dinosaurs. But if they do exist, they've yet to be discovered. Well, so what makes scientists say Aoraptor and Herarosaurus, you guys, you're the first true dinosaurs. Everybody else, fakers. (laughs) (laughs) Well, they both have a special feature in their skeletons that scientists have decided makes a dinosaur a dinosaur. So it has a hole in its hip socket. It has a ball shape on its femur that allows for attachment so that it can stand more upright. And it has pieces of its skeleton that are fused together that allow for that upright stance. So that's it? Just a hole in the hip socket, a couple merged backbone pieces that makes a dinosaur a dinosaur? (laughs) Yep, so it can stand upright. That doesn't mean that all dinosaurs walked on two feet. There's obviously a lot that walked on four. But what it does is helps them get their feet underneath them rather than sprawling out to the side like crocodiles and lizards. But what about like fearsome jaws and treacherous claws and like cool spikes on their tails? (laughs) No, it's all in that piece of the anatomy. Scientists trace the origins of the dinosaurs back through fossil skeletons to animals with hip sockets that look like they're just about to start having a hole. Like the evolution of springing a leak in your hip bone just takes hundreds of millions of years. (laughs) Apparently, that was a successful trait. After Eoraptor and Herarosaurus show up, paleontologists can see more and more dinosaurs appearing over the next 35 million years. More dinosaurs! Woo, dinosaur parties gotten started. There's lots of new species evolving and everything is great. But then something really big changes the world forever. We talked about the Triassic being a weird and wonderful world that all the continents were joined together into the supercontinent Pangaea. But at the end Triassic, it starts rifting apart. If you think of baseball seams on a baseball ripping apart. It literally, the continent rips apart and the Atlantic begins to open. What's actually causing that are these massive lava eruptions, which are huge cracks that go deep, deep into the earth. Wow. So like the earth just opens up and spews molten rock. Like, I guess you wouldn't want to be near that. We can see the remains of these lava eruptions today in the form of lava rocks. And we can tell when they happened, thanks to radioactive elements that set a chemical timestamp on them. Put together, the eruptions covered an area larger than the continental U.S. Whoa, that is enormous. These massive volcanic eruptions threw up all kinds of gases from deep, deep within the Earth's interior into the atmosphere. These gases made the climate go totally haywire. And it's a combination, a double whammy of it being hot for a long, long time following that kills plants and other life forms. Carbon dioxide and methane gas made it hot and sulfur gases made it cold. So there could have even been freezing temperatures in the tropical regions, which is not something we would ever associate with today's world. It got really cold, but only for brief snapshots of time throughout the million years that it took for all these lava eruptions to happen. So that's just nuts. Like, a million years of lava eruptions with flashes of cold spells? Like, who wants to live in that? We don't know how many animals actually wanted to live in that. <laughs> there was no polling data. But we can say data. that very few actually did. Scientists estimate that around half of life on Earth went extinct, including the ones at the top of the food chain. So in the late Triassic, the major predators were the crocodile-like creatures. But at this mass extinction event, those scaly creatures could not withstand the cold temperatures. All the crocodile-like creatures except the actual crocodile and the alligator went extinct. 
And that gave the dinosaurs the opening they didn't know they'd been waiting for. And so when the crocodile line creatures go extinct, well, dinosaurs, they basically end up with their competitors extinct and they grow to tremendous sizes and spread out throughout the world. So after the extinction event, the dinosaurs look around, see literally nothing big enough to challenge them and think, now's our time. (laughs) When dinosaurs took crocodiles place as the top predator on the planet, they could afford to evolve bigger and heavier. And we know that mainly from the footprint record. There are thousands and thousands of footprints along the coast of eastern North America. Scientists match these dinosaur footprints to dinosaur skeletons and then use chemical methods to date them or find out how old they are. Not like go out to the movies with the fossils, have them over for some dinner. Fossil, you got to have some more pasta, maybe? Oh, you don't eat because you're just a rock? Let's just say that back before they became fossils, the dinosaurs were definitely eating. The footprints of dinosaurs change in a way that indicate that their body mass doubled. This didn't happen overnight. Scientists think that the extinction event could have killed off almost all of the herbivores that were not dinosaurs. They were probably eating fish until different animals had enough time to evolve for them to start eating again. In other words, dinosaurs had to wait a while for a good carnivore meal. Wow, so it was like a slow rise of the dinosaurs. But, but what gave them the edge? Why didn't they go extinct along with the rest of life on Earth? We think it's a combination of two things. One is that dinosaurs were able to stand upright. So when there was a combination of massive warming and massive cooling, they could more easily maybe get up sides of mountains or this type of thing and actually escape local perturbations. Meaning individual dinosaurs could escape those dangerous changes in the environment. So they could move faster than other creatures. The second, and I think the most important, is that every major type of dinosaur we know in its juvenile or if it's in its infant form had feathers. And not necessarily the flat feathers that we talked about for flight, but feathers that were a downy, insulating one to keep them warm. That's something that their scaly competitors did not have. So dinosaur feathers were like the essential outdoor gear of the extinction event. So these cooling times that happen, crocodiles would not have been able to survive without a jacket, so to speak. But the insulation provided by feathers possibly allowed the dinosaurs to win the extinction lottery at this interval because that warmth was punctuated by brief times of super cold temperatures. Man, that's incredible. So dinosaurs just happen to have these two traits, like feathers and a hip socket with a hole in it. That's all they had to put in their bag to survive the trip. It's not what you would think of packing to a million years of lava eruptions, but evolution works in odd ways. It happened to favor the dinosaurs. They were lucky. And so are we, because dinosaurs are awesome, and we get to look at them now. Yes. Well, they're bones. Birds, Marshall, they're birds. All right, so we get to see grackles outside our window and think, hmm, awesome dinosaur. But to go back to Elizabeth and Andy, do we know this whole story about the rise of dinosaurs because of fossils? Like, are they right? They are, but it's not just fossils like bones. The story of the evolution and rise of dinosaurs is one that's not just based on the skeletons. It's based on these other chemical fossils, molecular fossils that tell us about the climate. These molecular fossils are found in the rock record that we mentioned earlier. They're tiny, but they're full of clues about the climate and the environment. Jessica's job is to find out what they mean. It's based on looking at other types of rock that tell us about the conditions at that time that all influence the dinosaurs themselves. You find yourself borrowing a little bit from chemistry, borrowing a little bit from biology, maybe some from physics or math. Paleontologists are using all the tools they have to fill in the details and round out the story behind the rise of the dinosaurs. The story Jessica just told us is what we know so far. There's lots more fossil clues out there. So there's lots more waiting to be discovered. (laughs) 
So what questions do you have about the rise of the dinosaurs? What more would you like to know about the world that they lived in and the extinction that they made it through? Thanks to Dr. Jessica Whiteside, Associate Professor of Ocean and Earth Science at the University of Southampton. And thanks to Elizabeth and Andy for sending their great dinosaur questions. Sarah Lentz is our head of partnerships. I'm Lindsay Patterson, and I wrote and produced this show. And I'm Marshall Escamilla, and I wrote all of the music. Thanks for listening, and stay tuned for more stories of science discovery. Music